This Embryology Highlight screencast, Genital System Development, presents development of the gonads, genital ducts, and external genitalia. An animal's genotype is determined by inheritance, but phenotype, anatomy and physiology, is determined by hormones. The XY genotype normally produces a testis. Supporting cells of the testis produce hormones that convert germ stem cells to spermatogonia that inhibit female duct development and that also promote male genital development in the presence of testosterone receptors. In the absence of testosterone hormones, a female develops by default. All genital development begins with an indifferent stage that then becomes either male or female. Genital anomalies commonly involve some degree of intersex appearance. Intermediate mesoderm of the gonadal ridge initially becomes an indifferent gonad that features supporting cells and germ cells. Supporting cells form gonadal cords. The supporting cells come from surface mesothelium and also from disintegrating mesonephric tubules. Germ cells originate in yolk sac endoderm and they have to migrate to the gonadal ridge. Germ cells depend on the supporting cells for their survival. Germ cells degenerate unless they are surrounded by supporting cells. This image shows the gonadal ridge in yellow along the dorsal border of the sea loam. Germ cells originating in yolk sac endoderm, the yolk sac is not shown, must migrate along the gut wall and up the dorsal mesentery to reach the gonadal ridge. In the testis, cords of supporting cells elongate, becoming seminiferous cords, and the germ cells become spermatogonia. There are two types of supporting cells in testes, sustentacular or Sertoli cells and interstitial cells. The Sertoli cells form the walls of the seminiferous cords, and these cells are responsible for converting germ stem cells into spermatogonia, otherwise germ stem cells would become oogonia by default. The sustentacular cells also release a hormone that suppresses female duct development. The other supporting cell, the interstitial cell, lies outside of the seminiferous cords and tubules. The interstitial cell releases testosterone. Testosterone is first released within the embryo where it promotes the growth of male genitalia. Subsequently, testosterone is released at puberty where it converts seminiferous cords to seminiferous seminiferous tubules and initiate spermatogenesis. In the ovary, germ cells become oogonia and supporting cells form follicles surrounding individual oogonia. Within each primordial follicle, the germ cell initiates meiosis that is not completed until subsequently ovulation and fertilization ensues. The female's lifetime allotment of germ cells and follicles is produced during embryogenesis. Male and female genital ducts are present in all embryos, the male being the mesonephric duct and the female the paramesonephric duct. Under the influence of testosterone from interstitial cells of the testis, the mesonephric duct will become the epididymis and ductus deferens. In the absence of testicular inhibitory hormones from sustentacular cells, the paramesonephric duct would become the uterine tube, uterus, and and part of the vagina. This image represents a transection through the urogenital ridge of an embryo. The future gonad which is colored brown, the mesonephric duct is green, and laterally a paramesonephric duct develops initially as a groove. Under the influence of testosterone, the mesonephric duct will become epididymis and ductus deferens, and in the absence of inhibitory hormones from the testis, the paramesonephric duct will go on to become uterine tube, uterus, and part of the vagina. 
This image presents an overview of your genital duct development via a ventral view of the abdomen and pelvis. The mesonephric duct is colored green. The paramesonephric duct is salmon colored. Both ducts are present early in embryonic development, gender indifferent stage. In the male, testicular hormones enable the mesonephric duct to become epididymis and ductus deferens. Also, testicular hormones inhibit development of the paramesonephric duct. In females, the absence of inhibitory hormones allows the paramesonephric duct to develop into the oviduct, uterine horn, and uterus, and the cranial end of the vagina. Also, in the absence of testosterone, the, the mesonephric duct fails to develop into male ducts. Female genital ducts are derived from the paramesonephric duct, which grows in the absence of testicular inhibitory hormone. The cranial part of the paramesonephric duct forms the uterine tube and uterine horn. The caudal part fuses bilaterally to form the single uterine body, uterine cervix, and the cranial third of the vagina. The vagina has a dual origin. The cranial third of it is formed from paramesonephric ducts. The rest of the vagina develops as an outgrowth of the vestibule. This image shows the dual origin of the vagina. This image shows transverse sections through the urogenital ridge at early and and later stages of development, and also at cranial and caudal levels through the urogenital ridge. The paramesonephric duct here, colored green, is also called the Mullerian duct. Cranially, the paramesonephric ducts become the uterine tube and uterine horn of the uterus. But caudally, bilateral paramesonephric ducts come together and fuse, forming the body of the uterus, the uterine cervix, and the cranial vagina. Within the urogenital ridge, the mesonephros is colored purple. As the mesonephros degenerates, its remnant becomes the broad ligament in the female. In the male, the remnant would become mesoductus deferens and mesochium. This image shows early to later stages of development of the vagina. Early in development, the fused paramesonephric ducts make contact with the caudal region of the urogenital sinus, the future vestibule. A solid vaginal plate tubercle grows outward from the vestibule, forming the caudal two-thirds of the future vagina. The solid tubercle undergoes cavitation, producing a hollow vagina. A hymen could persist at the junction with the vestibule, but a hymen is typically absent in our domestic mammals. In the presence of testicular hormones, the paramesonephric duct regresses, and the mesonephric duct develops into the epididymis and ductus deferens. Mesonephric tubules become efferent ductule. The mesonephric duct as a ductus deferens will empty into the urogenital sinus, and that will become the pelvic and penile urethra. Prostate and bulbourethral glands arise as outgrowths of urogenital sinus endoderm, and vesicular glands arise from the epithelium lining the mesonephric duct. This image shows the ductus deferens and epididymis connecting to the testis via efferent ductules. The ductules originate from mesonephric tubules as the mesonephrus breaks down. The tubules already communicate with the mesonephric duct, but they must establish communication with the reti testes, which drains seminiferous tubules. Both the seminiferous tubules and reti testes are derived from the seminiferous seminiferous cords formed by supporting cells of the gonadal ridge. Caudal to the testis, the degenerating mesonephrus forms a gubernaculum that guides the testis down to the scrotum. This image shows that ligaments to the gonads and the genital ducts are derived from remnants of degenerating mesonephros, here salmon colored. As the mesonephros degenerates, it leaves behind a genital fold. In females, the genital fold becomes the broad ligament, the mesovarium, the mesosalpinx, and the mesometrium. In males, the genital fold will be become the mesochium and the mesoductus deferens. 
a caudal extension of the genital fold that runs along the body wall and into the inguinal region may be called an inguinal fold. In females, the inguinal fold becomes the proper ligament of the ovary and the round ligament of the uterus. In males, the inguinal fold becomes the embryonic gubernaculum, which leads the testis to the scrotum. In adult males, it becomes the proper ligament of the testis and the ligament of the tail of the epididymis. This image, which we have seen before, shows the degenerating mesonephros in purple. In this case, it becomes the broad ligament. This image shows a genital fold, colored purple, leading from a testis down to the inguinal region, where the scrotum arises. This inguinal fold will become a gubernaculum, which leads the testis down to the future scrotum. The term gubernaculum comes from the Greek. It, it means a helm or the steer. And so this gubernaculum then will steer the testis to the scrotum. In both genders, the gonad will shift caudally as the embryo grows and the inguinal fold pulls caudally on the gonad. The extent to which the ovary moves caudally varies among our domestic species, but in all of our domestic mammals, the testis will normally descend into the scrotum. In males, the inguinal fold becomes a gubernaculum. Under hormonal influences, the gubernaculum accumulates fluid, becoming an enlarged gel that extends from the testis to the scrotum. The enlargement keeps the body wall open at the future inguinal canal. Subsequently, dehydration of the gubernaculum and outgrowth of the scrotum and growth of the embryo in a cranial direction all combine to pull the testis to the inguinal canal region. An increase in intra-abdominal pressure pops the testis through the inguinal canal and into the scrotum. This image diagrams stages of testicular descent. As the scrotum grows outward and the embryo grows forward and the gubernaculum shrinks, it pulls the testis to the inguinal canal. Notice that the gubernaculum has two regions. One is between the scrotal wall and the tail of the epididymis, and the other is between the tail of the epididymis and the gonad. Eventually, increased intra-abdominal pressure pops the testis into the scrotal compartment. Everything grows in size except for the gubernaculum, which shrinks, and it becomes in the adult the proper ligament of the testis and the ligament of the tail of the epididymis. Three features of the embryonic perineum develop into external genitalia in both genders. Bilaterally, urogenital folds, the caudal end of the urogenital sinus, border the opening into the urogenital sinus. A genital tubercle grows at the ventral juncture of the two urogenital folds, and bilaterally, urogenital swellings appear lateral to the urogenital folds. In females, the urogenital sinus gives rise to the vestibule. The caudal orifice of the urogenital sinus becomes the vulva cleft. The urogenital folds become labia of the vulva. The genital swellings disappear in our female domestic animals, but in women, the genital swellings develop into labia major. The genital tubercle becomes the clitoris. This textbook image shows early to later stages of of female genital development. This, the earliest, shows the caudal end of the urogenital sinus beginning to separate from the earlier cloaca. A cloacal membrane is evident and a genital tubercle appears ventrally. With further differentiation, the urogenital sinus is separating from the anal canal and the remnants of the cloacal membrane are disintegrating. Ultimately, the genital tubercle becomes the clitoris the urogenital folds become labia bordering the vulval cleft that leads to the vestibule, and the genital swellings disappear in our domestic mammals, although in women they become labia major. In males, the genital tubercle elongates and eventually becomes the glands at the free end of the penis. The penile urethra is formed by elongation of the urogenital folds. The bilateral genital swellings will merge on the midline to form a single scrotum which contains two compartments. 
This image shows the development of male external genitalia, beginning with a cloaca that gives rise to a urogenital sinus ventrally. The urogenital folds elongate and form a penile urethra. The folds border a urethral groove which must close to establish the penile urethra. The urethra zips closed from proximal to distal. A failure to completely close produces a developmental defect called hypospadias, where an opening on the ventral surface of the penis allows urine to flow. Meanwhile, the genital tubercle elongates to form a phallus. The phallus communicates with the urethral lumen only after the external ectoderm invades the tubercle and canalizes it. Although they are not genital organs, Mammary glands are associated with reproduction. In both genders, ectoderm forms bilateral ridges that regress, leaving behind mammary buds. Each mammary bud then will become a mammary gland. Mammary glands are formed by epithelial cord invasions that invade into the underlying mesoderm. The solid cords canalize and each cord then becomes a lactiferous duct. The number and location of mammary buds and the number of lactiferous ducts per mammary gland varies with the species. This image illustrates species variation in the number of lactiferous ducts per mammary gland teat. Ruminants have one large lactiferous gland per teat. Mares and the sows have two. Carnivores have multiple lactiferous ducts per teat, as do women. This concludes this embryology highlight screencast concerning genital system development.